Thank you. Good evening and welcome everyone to the Tuesday, May 8th regular school board business meeting. May we please rise to the, uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we begin with an approval of the school board minutes. May I have a motion? Um, I'm getting oh, there. sorry. For that, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, now can I have an approval for the school board minutes? I move that we approve the school board minutes for uh, budget workshop Tuesday, March 27th, 2018. Budget workshop Thursday, March 29th, 2018. Budget workshop Thursday, April 5th, 2018. Executive session Tuesday, April 10th, 2018. And regular business meeting 2010th, April 2018. Okay. I have a second. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Next up is comments from the student representatives here tonight. Hi everyone, um, Emily will not be joining us because she has lacrosse, um, but I'm happy to be here and to give you guys a quick few updates. Um, so things at the high school are going well right now. It's sort of a stressful time, um, especially for upperclassmen as it's AP exam weeks um, this week and next week. Um, students in AP classes have their exams. Um, but other than that, the spring sports season is in full swing. Um, our teams are looking good this year. Um, so that's exciting and that's keeping the, the school upbeat, I would say. Um, also, the theater club has its spring production um, and that will be shown at the end of the month, um, I think. Yeah, May 31st, June 1st, and June 2nd. Um, and if you are interested, or the community members are interested, they can find more details um, at CEH Theater Program, uh, the Facebook page. Um, and it is Disaster the Musical this year. Um, also, um, an event that's been, or multiple events that have been organized by um, the Gov teacher at the high school, Mr. Jordan, um, we've had, on Monday night, we had the gubernatorial Republican candidates, three out of four, um, were there and speaking. And then tomorrow night, there are um, House of Representative candidates coming from the Democratic Party. And then um, a little bit later in May, there will be the Democratic candidates coming to speak to AP Gov students, but also um, anyone in the community that's interested. Um, so that's very cool to sort of, for the, for the Gov students specifically, to sort of see that process um, play out. Um, sort of in conjunction with that, although it's a separate project, the Can We Project, um, which we have spoken about at the past meetings, um, its sort of culmination event is on Thursday, this Thursday, um, at Westbrook Performing Arts Center. There will be, I believe, 10 of the gubernatorial candidates there um, for an open dialogue with the students about issues ranging from gun policy to race relations um, and a lot in between. So that should be really interesting and for Cape Elizabeth students are participating in that with kids from other schools. So it's been a really cool project. Um, I personally am a part of it and um, John Holdridge is the advisor for that. So it's been really awesome. Um, the art show is also going on at Cape Elizabeth, or at the high school, um, and if you guys are around the high school at all, I definitely encourage you to check it out. There are some really, really awesome pieces there, and some really talented art artists that have um, been able to showcase their work. Um, so that's really cool. Um, what else? Uh, prom is coming up. Prom is May 19th, so tickets have been on sale. Um, it's at the Portland Club this year, um, and the theme is A Night Under the Stars. Um, so that's another thing for upperclassmen specifically to look forward to. Um, and 
then lastly, uh, if you have been around the high school or if you're going soon, I encourage you to check out the yellow tulips, mm -hmm. um, which are in full bloom right now, um, which is really awesome. May is um, Mental Health Awareness Month, and the Yellow Tulip Project, like uh, the community-wide uh, group, we had our big event on Sunday, um, and it was really awesome. It was drizzling a little, which was a bit of a bummer, but um, it was still really powerful and a hopeful event, so that's awesome, and we're hoping to continue having um, some awareness events throughout the month, possibly including something in the student-wide assembly in the future. Um, so, yeah, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you, Allison. I noticed the tulips this morning. They were so beautiful yeah. and so um, definitely positive and joyful. I love the yellow yeah. choice. So fun to walk into the school and just see those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, do we have any um, members of the public who would like to make comments on the agenda items? Seeing none, okay. We will move on to communications. Uh, first, we have Jason Manjuritas, who would like to present a report on a volunteer. Okay. Good evening. I wanted to take the opportunity tonight to introduce you to a Pond Co volunteer. Um, as you can probably imagine, at the elementary level, we're blessed with many volunteers, but I asked um, Beth Carey to come tonight to speak just for a couple of minutes about what she does. Um, and, I, and I will let her do that, but I will say um, she really makes a unique contribution that um, impacts many teachers and, and many students. So I'll, I'll let her tell you about that. But Beth, do you mind coming up for a moment? Um, Kim, good to see you. Uh, like Kim, I have a child in the middle school and a child in the elementary school. Um, I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I was a work-at-home mom for 21 years, but I retired early because of carpal tunnel, and uh, had a little free time after that, so having started going to the swap shop, because it's always a treat to do when you have some free time, uh, I was offered a volunteer position there, and it was great to do when the kids were in school and I had a little free time. And then uh, the newsletter, the school newsletter that would come out every week would have lists of things that the school needed, like they always need tennis balls for the chairs or someone's looking for, gosh, I can't remember, but I recognized that all the things that come into the swap shop all the time are things that the school can use because we have an incredibly generous community that is interested in recycling and there's so many books and toys and games and Legos and things that are constantly coming through the swap shop and rather than letting it sort of get overwhelmed there, I started bringing things into the school and taking requests from the teachers as well, what types of books they're looking for, Legos have been really popular requests for our, most of our classrooms for rainy days and uh, I started doing it this year for the middle school as well fitting their needs are a little more challenging because there's such a wide range of readership in the middle school and they're much more serious, so not as much room for games and toys and whatnot, but it's been incredibly satisfying to do to be that go-between with um, all the things that our community provides. That when someone doesn't need it, someone else does, and knowing that it's coming from one Cape kid and going right back to several other Cape kids right within sort of closes the circle of what recycling you know can and should be so um, I've been enjoying doing it and I hope to do it for quite a bit more <laughs> thank you thank you thank, thank you, you so, so much. much and just before we move on I just want to add um, Beth do you do you have a a routine or a schedule it seems like you're always at school is it like every Right. So I just wanted to point out, it's very significant. That every time you go into the mail room, there are new items on, and teachers are coming in and shopping. So it's not just a, you know, she comes in and then a month later we see her again. It's constant. It's very, it's great stuff. So nice. thank you. 
Thank, thank you. you, Beth, and thank you, Jason, for letting us know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next up, we have a leadership team updates from the principals and business manager. Sure. Might as well. <laughs> So I just have a few things tonight. Um, I just want to point out, I know I've mentioned uh, in the past um, our uh, Preble Street donation drive, um, which um, that um, idea was generated from a, a third grade student. Um, and so that was very successful. We collected donations um, up until uh, April 27th, and we had a representative, um, Ray Halperin from Preble Street um, visit Pond Cove to with with a big box with a little box truck to collect the donations, and we had several boxes of needed items. Um, and he spent some time with a group of third graders talking about um, how important their donations were. It was extremely powerful that day, um, so that was a big success. Um, so also just to highlight, uh, last week we had two spring concerts. We had second grade on Tuesday night and um, first grade on Thursday night. Um, huge turnout, as you would expect, just cafetorium full of parents, big smiles. And um, Rebecca Bean is just amazing um, what she's able to do seeing students so infrequently but somehow pull this performance together. So that was a great success to see all the parents and the students together at Pond Cove. Um, just to mention that um, I'm learning that Teacher Appreciation Week is a really big to-do at Pond Cove. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, the PCPA um, has, been, has a lot planned and, um, and the office staff, we have a few things planned too as well so the teachers are able to have something kind of fun and different every single day this week. And it's, it's just amazing to see that the, the work that um, some of these parents and community members put into this, you can see their appreciation very clearly. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, tomorrow, as you may know, is National Bike or Walk to School Day. And so we're strongly promoting that at Pond Cove. And I'd like to thank Heather Kennedy for um, really getting the word out in terms of um, encouraging student participation as well as safety. Um, really emphasizing the fact that students need to wear bike helmets and, and letting um, parents know well in advance to make sure that students have appropriately fit bike helmets and that parents have been able to talk with students about crosswalk safety. So that's tomorrow. Um, so we're expecting a very large turnout um, of bikers and, and walkers tomorrow. So that's it for tonight. Great. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Kind of similar to a little bit of what Jason said. It's, I forget, I feel like I've been here a long time now, but it's still the first time I've been through May, the first time I've been through April. And you start to realize, ooh, that's how this works here. Um, so it's, it's been pretty interesting to see um, it's not me organizing the eighth grade and last day of school, it's you know parents that are doing it. And that level of community engagement and involvement in our school is just, uh, I think it's very unique and powerful. Um, in a lot of places, that's, it's kind of like, no, that's, we'll take care of that. And, and here I love the fact that the parents are really welcomed and encouraged and, and expect to get in there and do that kind of stuff. So I think that just goes to adding to the whole feeling of one community um, working to solve and do all this stuff. So I think that's been very powerful. Um, I've survived another spirit week, which is always, you never know how that's going to go, but it, it came and went fine. Uh, the other big thing coming up, which Early in the year, it sounded kind of easy to me, and now I'm realizing it's, it's just amazingly challenging, um, is the Festival of Curiosity, and how in-depth and well thought out and well planned that is, and you know, it's just walking presenters through the building today, and it just, it, it's amazing to me to see the level of organization that goes into that from a pretty small group of people that it kind of spearheaded and got that going. Um, so that again, it's, it's just another opportunity provided by our, by our community for our kids that is not really in the school yet. You know, I think the school's starting to pick it up and figure out where we fit and how it all goes together, but it's a pretty powerful group of people. Um, 
and my email blows up all the time. So we have a, a running joke about that, but they're always after me. Uh, <laughs> but there's, there's just a lot of organization to go on with it. Uh, the big thing right now for us is planning step ups and transitions. So stepping up into fifth grade, stepping up into ninth grade, transitions in the middle. Uh, so really starting to plan that out and, and thoughtfully um, figure out how we're gonna introduce kids and scheduling and the goal would be to have it before the end of the year, kids scheduled, which is always an ambitious goal, but uh, I think we're, it's, it's within sight. It can, I think it, it might happen. Uh, the lot, one of the last things I would say is we, I kind of had a discussion back when the walkout occurred with a young lady who is pretty passionate and I said, hey, that's great, but you know, what are you going to do? Where are you going to be in two months, three months, you know, when, when everybody else has forgot? She didn't forget. So she's back after me again, uh, and, and Howard was invited to, to attend a meeting with us. And just the, how important it is, school safety is to her, and the steps that she's taking to organize, she's trying to, to organize another event. And I'm not sure what we're gonna call it yet. It might be the, a spring festival, safety festival, I'm not sure yet, but it's really about inclusion, tolerance, um, diversity and, and, and really working on those kind of kind of things. So she's got some really good ideas kind of that's coming. I think uh, May 20, do we have a workshop on the 22nd maybe? Um, so I'm going to invite her to come with me to that and, and present to you guys her, her thoughts. Uh, but I, I find it just amazing that she's so ambitious. And then um, lastly, the Chiwanki send-off was today. And if you've never seen it, that's a new thing for me too. It's kind of the, the lineup and the parents and the salute and uh, it's, it's a pretty big deal. And I'm standing out there thinking, wow, this is a big deal. And then Mr. Strout comes out with his archery unit and his bow and arrows and I grab his arrow and say, no, 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 no. We're not, not until those buses leave. We're not gonna do that. Um, but so it's just a lot of really neat things I've learned that have come from a small community that supports schools. So, and it just keeps coming. And, and I find that impressive, so thanks. Thank you. So just a few miscellaneous things. Um, first, paths enrollment. When we started this school year, there were six students enrolled in paths, which is a pretty typical number uh, for most of the last number of years. Uh, for next year, we have 17 students enrolled in paths, so that's way more than doubled, almost tripled. Um, so that's in large part, I think, due to an excellent job that Kevin Stilfin, the principal at paths, did when he talked, spoke to all of our sophomores, I think. People were really impressed by that, so I knew the board would be interested in that. Um, so second thing, I was also gonna mention the yellow tul tulips that Ali um, mentioned. They are quite a tribute to a student-led and importance of mental health and that sort of thing, and I wanted to tie that into this. Um, I have been thinking a lot about, uh, there have been a couple discussions the last couple days related to anxiety. Not so much school anxiety, but anxiety among teens. Um, and I came across this article in the New York Times. I actually photocopied it, but then I figured I shouldn't on TV present photocopied materials that I don't have copyright to. So um, I thought what I would do is tell you the name of the, so there was an article in the New York Times Magazine, October 11th, 2017. And it was titled, Why Are More Teenagers Than Ever? suffering from severe anxiety. So again, why are more teenagers than ever suffering from severe anxiety? New York Times Magazine, October 11, 2017, I thought it was fascinating. Talks a lot about social media, talks about parental pressure, talks about college, talks about a whole lot of things and really explores in depth the experience of a few kids at a, um, high performing, I think it was a private school that they focused on primarily, but the same issues take place everywhere. Um, I will offer my own personal top three reasons, I think, and they factor into uh, the article. And one is I've definitely been doing a lot of reading this year about cell phones and social media and the 24 hour connected mindset that sort of is built on envy and sort of a sense of perfection that one perceives in others that is really not healthy, it's not 
safe, it's not, just not good. So that's when, number one, social media. Number two, I think there's some issues, without being political about this, some issues about the future that um, families and students worry about, um, certainly in a politically polarized climate. I think, I think kids absorb some of that. I think issues about the economy, which has gotten a little bit, and probably the environment as well. Some issues about the future that kids worry about. And then I will say that, and I've mentioned this to the board before, college admissions has become such a obsession and random thing. Um, I actually, if the board is interested in having to hearing from Elizabeth Thomas, our college counselor at some point, I'm sure she'd love to come and share her perceptions of trends in college admissions and that sort of thing. I've learned things from her every time I talk to her. Um, and I think it would, it would be great for the board to know that. So, um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is we did have a music concert last week. Um, the highlight of the band concert, I thought, was a world premiere. It amazes me, I've never, been at a high school which does so many world premieres, um, sort of commissioned works of music. So this was a commissioned work of music that um, the Wind Symphony played, um, composed by Nancy Gunn, who happens to be a Cape parent and a talented musician. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that um, three or four years ago, at the choral part of our concert, um, the chorus consisted of about six to eight kids. Um, and now it's 25 and growing. Um, it's really, really cool um, the way it's taken on a life. And there's a lot of guys, including from deep, very deep voices. And it's becoming a cool thing to do, which is really kind of neat. So just one. And they're in a competition right yeah, now. I was just going to say, can you talk about that? Because we can all vote, right? Yeah. And isn't it true that you can vote every day? Every day, I believe. <laughs> yeah, they're in a competition. I don't know the exact website, but it's to perform with Foreigner um, when they come to Maine. So you they can get there from Facebook, as I do every day. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, no. um, there are, uh, I think, six or seven schools, um, and they have videos of them singing a song, and you can vote every day. And they're so. amazing. Yeah, so good. I, I think you can actually get to that from the school website. I think <coughs> the district website has mm -hmm. a has an article and I'll link to it as well. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. Oh, <laughs> you can't forget me. Come on. <laughs> um, I am very happy to come and present today, and, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to do this on every business meeting. Um, this way, I get to get filmed. Yay. Um, so I was just going to try to do a quick overview of the financial statement. The cover sheet that you see, this is required by state statute. These are the 11 categories slash cost centers that we are required to um, use as a format for our budget. So this is, this is like a legal document on top. And you will notice that one of the items is negative, and that is why um, in the agenda tonight you are voting to give the superintendent authority to move money from one of the other cost centers categories to into the negative category to um, make it not negative anymore. This is also part of the state statute that this is required by law to do that. Um, and you can't end the year with a negative cost center category. I keep going between category and cost center because the law speaks to these things in both formats, but cost center is also used in other terms in state statute, so we try to keep them as categories to kind of keep them straight. So that's one of the one, this is one of the major things. Um, another item is that just the overall printout. This, this budget, uh, if you look at behind the cover page, page one, um, this is, it's called an appropriation control report. I look at it as an expenditure report because what it's doing, it's comparing your budget that you um, appropriate uh, through the budget process and then you're comparing it by what we've actually spent. So it's budget to, act, the, the DOE terms it as budget to actuals. So um, 
And if you have any questions about how to read the report or if you want any more clarification about anything, just, just let me know, give me a holler. Um, we, I, every month, even though we don't always meet, every month I do look at the report to make sure that we're right on, we're on track or if there's any issues or anything. And what I do is um, I look at how many pay periods have, have been paid through the year. And at this point, we have, since July 1st, we've had 22 pay periods. There's a total of 26. Um, what I do is I take 22 and divide it by the 26, and we, if you look at the report, you'll see a percentage on the far right. We, all the salaries for the teachers, administrators, central office, and custodians who are all paid year-round, they should all be at like 84.62%. The teachers are a little less. That has to do with audit entries and stuff. Um, and if you notice, most of the area's salaries were on track. There are some that are low. Um, and I'll quickly point out here. Um, guidance at Pond Cove um, Department 8705 is only 50% spent. Because when we budgeted, we were paying for a guidance counselor and a social worker out of that account. That social worker resigned last year after the budget. So we did hire another social worker, but we felt at that time that those person's services would be better suited doing other work within the school district. So, um, and the DOE requires that we charge the accounts of the work that they're actually doing. So this person is now a special ed. Um, doing a sort of special ed uh, work. So they're being paid out of a special ed account. And if you go through the report, you'll notice that one of our special ed accounts for social work is overexpended. So you'll see movement. And most of the special ed accounts, you'll see them underexpended or overexpended because the, the ed techs follow the kids. Or we have kids leave and we have new ones come in and um, students who need new IEPs and we have to hire ed techs. So you, you, the, you'll never, it's very unusual actually to see that we're right on track for everything because things happen. Um, it goes along. Um, so I didn't want to spend the whole time talking about this. If you have any questions, let me know. If, if you want to clarifications now or later on, I'd be happy to respond. Um, and that's pretty much it. I just wanted a quick here. Here it is. <laughs> just a quick comment for context. So this, this is typical at the end of the year where you have the different state budget categories that there's usually a little bit of a reallocation amongst the categories. So this, and this is just that time of year yes. where we make those routine allocations. We did the same thing the last year, yes. if I recall, and the year before that, yep. right around this time of year, as you're coming to the end of your fiscal year, some accounts are a little bit over, some accounts are a little bit under, but you're sort of managing to an overall budget, and these are just the required categories where they have to move, and yes. we then move the amounts to meet the budget for that fiscal year. Correct, and if you look at the agendas for previous years, it normally happens in June, but I felt it was good to get this um, out there sooner. Every year you have voted to approve transfers between the categories, so this is a very typical situation. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you. Um, I'm so glad that we are now including this in our regular business meeting as opposed to workshops. Okay, I am too, actually. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, um, good, good evening, all. Um, I, um, first of all, want to just take a second and acknowledge um, the jump in enrollments for next year at PAS. This is a very big deal. I mean, I, I, I um, it, it, it exceeds my, um, my um, hope for next year. I mean, I, I, I just, uh, to think that we have 17 students going there next year is, um, to me, uh, music, to, music to my ears. I think that we're going to find those students are going to um, gain a lot from that, and they'll speak to their classmates, and hopefully it will become, um, PASS will become a, a more popular um, option for some of our students every year. And I, and I think that whatever you can do to try and help encourage that, uh, as a board, I think that would go a long way. Uh, there are things that we've done this year that, have, that, that I think have, uh, in, in a minor way, contributed, and I think just keep it up. But and I think that uh, Principal Shed was uh, very generous in saying that he gives a lot of credit to the principal at PAS for coming over. I'm sure that was a big help. 
But honestly, I think that uh, Jeff Shedd and the counselors at the school and others have really done the heavy lifting here and, and, and deserve a lot of credit. So I just wanted to publicly say that. I'm really, really proud of that. Um, on the past theme for a second, I want to just let you know that their graduation is set for the 31st of May. And it's, it's a Thursday evening. And it's from 6 to 8 o'clock at night at the Merrill Auditorium. And so the students that are in the morning program and the afternoon program all come and present their, their work and their training and their, their skills. And um, it, it would be nice to have some board members show up to congratulate the, um, the graduates and their families. What was the date? I saw six uh, I think I wrote down the 31st of, of May, it's, I, if, I, if I got it right. It's a Thursday evening. Yes. At, again, at Merrill Auditorium, Portland. Um, I wanted to also take a second and go back to um, the point that was also raised by um, Principal Shedd about um, cell phones and um, social media and its relationship um, to stress and anxiety, depression, it can be for, for young people. To the credit of our three nurses, um, and one of them is here tonight, Erin Taylor, they came to me, the nurses came to me earlier this year and asked if we could try and think about addressing this with students and faculty and parents um, to try and just have a more complete discussion about cell phone use and um, what's appropriate, what's legal, what's dangerous. Um, and we um, were able to find someone who is, uh, you know, is highly recognized throughout the country from um, the University of California at Los Angeles. And we've been talking to her and she's, she's on board with us for next year. And, and um, Mrs. Taylor and the other nurses presented to CIF recently um, a proposal for a grant. And as you may have heard, the Thompson family uh, is working with CIF to come up with a grant that's an annual grant aimed toward um, mental health support for students and parents. This may be one of those grants that's going to be supported by that grant. Um, this proposal may be supported. And so we're hopeful. And um, if, the, if the presenter comes out, professor comes out, she would actually, we think, be here for two days. There would be workshops for parents, be workshops for faculty, workshops for students. I mean, conversations and presentations. Um, and we heard from a large group of people that are on the CIF board when they review the grants that the parents that were there are saying they really are looking for this. They, uh, well, what's the right time to introduce them to their young children? What's the right way? What do you do when things, how do you manage this? Um, what are some guidelines for all of us? So anyway, it, I think it's a real legitimate priority and I just want you to know that um, we're, we're moving forward with, with this. We think we've got a good plan in place and hopefully you'll see this sometime in, I don't know, maybe October of next year. So stay tuned on that one. Um, Aaron, you want to say more about that? Okay. Okay. So um, I wanted you to know that uh, today um, I received an email from uh, Senator Rebecca Millette asking if she could meet sometime soon with town uh, manager um, Matt Sturgis and me to talk about school finance. And so um, we're all have agreed to meet tomorrow um, and, and I look forward to the conversation. I don't know really what she's thinking and, and, and um, um, but Matt and I had a brief conversation about this today, but I just wanted you to know, uh, you know, we t this was, has been brought up a lot I, and budget planning was brought up a lot last night at the town council meeting. And I want you to know that we, um, we are meeting and we'll be talking about this and I'll get back to you what I, what I hear and what, what ideas are, are, are floated. Um, let's see. We're, we're, we have principals and nurses and social workers meeting soon with Seif and the Thompson family again about this annual 
grant that I mentioned earlier, I won't get into that again, but just know that there's some really interesting ideas that have come up, some from nurses, some from social workers about things that we could do that could really impact in a positive way uh, over time to reduce the, 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 the tension and anxiety that too many of our students talk about and, and feel. Um, so our hat goes off to the Thompsons for being out there offering to, to really be involved and support this effort. Um, I'm, I'm, I attended a meeting yesterday at the University of Southern Maine where this group of um, districts, again there are 11 districts, the so-called Greater Sebago Educational Alliance. We met around several topics. The major topic was professional development. Um, yesterday was professional development for leaders, school leaders, and then there'll be other ones for teachers. But um, I think there's clearly a lot, that I see a lot of potential here um, for professional development, ways that we can support each other. I personally don't feel that um, USM um, or any college is the, is the best and only place for us to do professional development. I think actually some of it could come from ourselves and from our and providing opportunities for people to come together and just talk and work together and and uh, support each other. But that's a large, large discussion. Just know that we are having these conversations. USM is interested in working with us, and and that, so good. Um, so I want you also know that this Thursday, the 10th of May, will be interviews for both um, Andrea Fuller's position as the administrative assistant to the superintendent, which is really, um, it, it isn't an, enough of a description for what um, Andrea does. I mean, you just, I don't think anybody here really understands what a role she plays in this district. I mean, it's really impressive and um, it's been such a joy to work with her. But she, as you know, she's moving over into the technology department in our school district. And so there's obviously is a vacancy, some a big vacancies. That will be, interviews for that will be held this Thursday. And um, also later in the day, there'll be interviews for the director of special services. And Donna uh, Wolfram, your new superintendent, she'll be here for both of those interviews. So I'm glad about that. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Howard. Yep. Um, I, you're right. I, n none of us here, other than you, know how hard um, and complicated and complex Andrea's role is. And it's going to be um, a hard transition for the board. It will be new for Donna, so it won't be as difficult. But we have been blessed with a really amazing um, administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. You have. I think we're lucky that she is at least still in the district for her um, historical knowledge mm -hmm. is invaluable. Yep. And I commend her for wanting to take on a new challenge, mm -hmm. which she has been preparing for, you know, yeah. half, half the time this year. Yeah. Uh, I'm also um, happy to hear that we're taking our, perhaps our first step um, to, when you meet with Rebecca, you and um, Matt, um, the first step towards collaborating mm -hmm. um, between the town council and school board. That's, yep. like, that's great. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, so the next item on the agenda is response to a citizen's concerns. Um, as many of people may be aware, early last month, a citizen of Cape Elizabeth, Janet Biliotti, who I'm happy to see is in the audience tonight, um, composed a lengthy email raising a variety of concerns she has with the school board. In particular, these are not all of them, but the, the ones that have this um, were repeated the most, I believe, in, se in several um, different events with the issues of errors which were reported in the uh, annual financial audit, issues with transparency, transparency of process and decision making by the school board, and leadership decisions made by the school board. Before I provide a brief review of some of the responses which I gave to Ms. Filiotti on May 4th, I wanted to provide a little context of my own. First, Ms. Viliotti never approached, I want this to be clear, that Ms. Viliotti never approached the superintendent or any of the school board members with her concerns listed in her email. The first time the school board was given the courtesy of knowing any of this is when she emailed the town council on April 8th, whereby she cc'd the school board. 
the d next day or day afterwards, um, uh, Matt Sturgis, per uh, Janet's request in her letter to the town council wanting to have a joint uh, meeting between town council and school board, the next day or two, um, the town manager, Matt Sturgis, approached Howard Coulter about meeting and um, Howard uh, spoke to the school board and given that it was two days before spring break um, and the agenda for April, there was no time to meet before, um, you know, there was no time to meet in the immediate future. And that was relayed to um, the town council and to the town manager. I just want to be clear, there was never a rejection to, to um, it was never a rejection to meet with town council. On April 13th, I personally emailed Ms. Biliotti, Ms. Biliotti to acknowledge receipt of her email and letting her know that I would be asking our superintendent to look into all of this at our next regular business meeting, which is tonight. I also let her know that the school board would be happy to answer any other questions she might have, but Ms. Viliotti was not interested in this. In preparation for this discussion tonight, I have completed an extensive response to Mrs. Viliotti's issues and I have emailed them to her, and I emailed them to her on May 4th. At last night's public hearing, Ms. Viliotti acknowledged receipt of my responses for the first time. I have shared my responses with the entire school board with the direction to report back tonight any outlying questions they may have. If there are any, then we will request that Howard Coulter will look into finding more answers and report back to us at our next business meeting. For your information, a complete set of responses to Ms. Filiotti's emails can be found on the school website by going to the school board tab and under the school board tab selecting meetings and materials and then navigating to the May 8th um, meeting, which is tonight. Now with regards to issues with the audit and the reporting of significant deficiencies, without going into to all the details, what I want to say is that first of all, there was never any gross negligence. Um, any errors that were included in the auditor's report have been taken seriously. The school board, town council, town manager, and the auditors have met three different times and have, have developed a strategy to avoid um, certain various mistakes in the future. We have taken all necessar necessary steps to make sure this happens um, and we know that this, the business manager and the school board and superintendent accept full accountability and accept that we are expected not to have these errors in the future. That is what we promise to do. With regard to transparency, there seems to be two areas which Ms. Which Ms. Viliotti is referring to um, in two different of her two different sections of her emails. Uh, her email she she refers to um, two things that both re refer to transparency. One are executive sessions, and two um, an issue with leadership decisions around um, the uh, dismissal, the, the the departure of two administrators. I want to say that in terms of executive sessions, I, I outlined to Ms. Filiotti uh, a very thorough uh, explanation of all the reasons we um, must meet in executive session. We are not allowed to meet, we are not allowed to discuss in public various things such as personnel, such as um, contracts and negotiations um, with employees, um, Student matters related to conduct or otherwise. Uh, what else? Legal consultation. Legal consultation. Any meeting that we have to discuss applicants to be hired, in particular for superintendent, that cannot be discussed in public. So by pointing out that we had 31 executive sessions, um, to me it felt it was implying that we were, we were hiding something. And I just want to be clear that it would be, in many cases, much easier to discuss things in public because they would avoid a lot of confusion and conspiracy thoughts. So as much as I understand her concern for not being involved in all decisions, with all due respect, by law, we are not allowed to discuss it in public, and I'm sure you can respect that. In terms of leadership decisions, again, this, ha this has to do with what is discussed in private. 
And as you know, Ms. Vigliotti, from um, your research, the, the details of the release agreements could not be discussed in public. In fact, none of it could be said even if we wanted to because in the contract it speaks specifically to that. It is at the, at the, um, at the judgment of the administrators to disclose or not disclose. We are not allowed to. The only way, and it says this in the contract, that it can be discussed is if a citizen or someone brings it to, retrieves it through law, through Freedom of Information Act. That is the only way this information can be put out there. That said, just to clarify, again, there were no secret deals, no secret decisions made in um, executive session around this. I can say with confidence that all seven board members involved in these discussions took this very seriously and came unanim unanimously to the conclusion that we reached. And despite the criticism that we've been receiving or the questions that we've received from you, would we do it again? You bet, because this is what we decided and we still believe this was the best decision, the best move to provide the best education for our teachers and to support our teachers, support our best education for our students and support our teachers. We stand by our decision with no regrets and no apologies. If there's anybody else that would like to fill, um, fill in, if you've had a chance to review the report, you may. But I, I think that those were the three main points that I took away um, that I wanted to address tonight. I'm going to say to the school board and to anybody watching, listening, if you have, if this, if my uh, response generates any further questions from the school board or the public, feel free to email us. And as far as the school board goes, let myself know, and I will compile if there are any questions for Howard, and he will report and get report back to us and get give us the answers we might have. Yeah, John's hands up. John, so I just like to add um, a little bit to. Um, so first of all, I'd like to reiterate: we've yet to be addressed directly, or asked a question directly, but we're addressing these concerns tonight. Uh, in the letter that was sent to the town council and CC to us, there were a number of what I consider fairly serious accusations of financial mismanagement, administrative mismanagement, lack of transparency, enormous fiduciary duty that has been shirked. Um, I vehemently disagree with all of those. I think what you'll see is you see examples of many public budget sessions to discuss exactly these issues, including a public session about the audit where all of these things were discussed publicly with the town council and the school board and the public available to be present. I think we'll see a number of executive sessions that show not a lack of or mismanage, but of management. We're here to make the tough choices. We're here to deal with the personnel matters, the contracts, the student matters, all those things. I mean, what you see actually is not evidence, is evidence of management, not of mismanagement. Now, when management makes a decision, that doesn't mean everyone's going to l agree with it or like it or even understand it. But that's what we're here to do. We make those decisions and we stand by those decisions. And all of those decisions, for the most part, I believe have been unanimous. The other thing I'd like to talk about briefly is about transparency. Uh, transparency is something that happens in public and often a good way to do that is through dialogue. And we've not been able to actually engage in a dialogue because we've been yet to been addressed directly. But one of the things that dialogue also requires is some precision and understanding of common terms. And I um, was frustrated in that what you had addressed to us seemed to lack some precision around things like um, indicating that uh, monthly reports um, were not generated. I spoke to our business manager just before this meeting, and from my understanding from hers is that it's not, she did not actually say that they were not generated. She said some of them had not been posted to the website. That's a very different thing. So I understand how you may have misunderstood it. I only want to think the best for everybody, but precision and dialogue is important, and if you want to address those concerns to us, we can answer them. Also, you sort of indicated that there was $4 million in commingled funds in the audit report. That is not what it says. 
What it says is capital expenditures were commingled within expenditure lines. What that means is I can't tell how much I may have spent on a generator versus a window. There's no money missing. When I hear commingled funds in a setting like this, it makes me anyway think of mixing of public and private funds in a way that might be criminal. This is nothing that looks like that. And precision in these dialogues is important. And at that audit meeting, we talked about this exactly. There's nothing that's missing. What has happened is something that is a significant deficiency, which is also in the audit report, less severe than a material weakness, but needs to be brought to the attention of those who are in management. And that is exactly what has done, and we have exactly taken corrective action around those measures. You, be, we need to be careful not to confuse a lane violation with a head-on collision, and be interested in outcomes and not outrage. So we take these concerns seriously. We're ag happy to engage in dialogue, but that requires dialogue on your part with us and precision around the terms that we're talking about. So if there are any still unanswered questions, um, it helps to be specific because when there are things like possible violations, I may possibly have an answer, but if you have a specific concern, we may have a specific answer. Elizabeth? I'd like to just thank you, Susanna, and I know you worked very hard with Howard and Catherine and probably a lot of other people to um, generate this very, um, lengthy and thorough um, response. I think it was appropriate. And um, I think you gave it the time and definitely the energy that, um, that it deserved. And I appreciate your, your work on this. Um, it did take a while. Um, I take issue with the idea that if we had nothing to hide that we could just come up with everything off the top of our heads. Um, I really appreciate the time and the thought that you put into this. And um, I hope that um, similar to the email that was circulated widely among the public, that people will also take advantage of um, this because it's publicly posted. Thank you. So thank you. All right. Good. Thank you. Moving along. We are going to um, item 6A. May I have a motion, please? I move we approve fundraising for the benefit of the Pond Cove Elementary School Playground. Second. Any discussion? No? Do, do, do you want to hear a little bit about this? Yeah. She, she loves to speak publicly. I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why you are um, presenting this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for this upcoming budget, um, we, we've been, for, this has been an ongoing project for five years that we've been pushing to um, try to have the playground redone for safety reasons, um, increased injuries we've seen on the playground, wear and tear of the equipment that's out there. Um, several elements have not passed inspection on the playground and had to be removed last summer. And um, so we've been working with an architect um, who generated these beautiful plans for us. And it, it, was, it came to be after um, a lot of work with student involvement um, through having them generate ideas um, during their guidance lessons to share what their dream playground would be like. Um, about three or four years ago, we had a charrette with, um, which took, I didn't, it's a French word for a, a gathering, a, a meeting where we had worked with stakeholders. We had members from the school board, parents association, CEF, teachers, students, um, and other stakeholders who came together to also share ideas about their dream playground for Pond Cove. And um, it's just been a matter of trying to find funding to support the project. And the way that the architect took all of those ideas was to have it be done in phases because our playground is very wide and spread out. And um, for the next fiscal budget, the area that we thought needed the most attention right now was nature land. We have the gazebo out there that's starting to rot and have problems out there. Um, that it was designed as being an area for teachers to use as an outdoor education opportunity. And um, the flow of the gardens right now 
is not conducive to a lot of um, educational opportunities out there. It's the access to water and where the gardens are located and just to have more uh, flower beds out there, have more opportunities for natural play for the children. Um, and so that was one area that we thought was really important um, to address. And um, unfortunately due to cuts at the state, we have lost that funding now to have it be added to the budget this year. So we're looking at other opportunities that we can try to raise some money. And so um, tomorrow, Jason and I are going to meet with the Parents Association to see if we can brainstorm some ideas that we might be able to bring some funding in. Um, and at some point, we would also like to talk with town council to see if there's another way, because that playground is used not only by Pond Cove students, but by the community at large, that maybe we can readdress trying to figure out other ways um, through the town to try to find some funding as well. But, but, but also, am I right that you said that um, you're seeing more injuries now than... Yes. Would you mind, would you mind just repeat, explaining that? Well, I think a lot of it had to do... Um, so some of the structures were out there were not... Um, so it's the slides came down that were on the playground structure and those weren't set to code. There's certain elements that have... There's... Um, certain parameters that have to be passed when the play structures are put up. And I, my understanding is that some of the, uh, we haven't been doing a great job about inspecting every year the elements that are out there. And so there's been a lot of wear and tear. And so we've had um, kids falling off the structures, breaking bones. And um, there's lots of uneven earth on the playground surfaces where kids are falling to holes and um, twisting angles and falling and other areas that they're getting hurt. There's lots of loose gravel and rocks out there. Um, so there's just different safety concerns that are out there that really need to be taken care of. And so a lot of the maintenance that um, this new project would do is just to make it easier for our um, maintenance staff to be able to maintain the area out there better. We, um, last summer we were able to have some funding through the Department of Transportation where we were able to address a few elements of concern where our um, basketball courts were the, uh, the grounding was all uneven there, so lots of kids were falling there. The um, basketball course was supposed to be wrapped in a certain kind of material, and that had fallen off, and so kids were crashing into the poles and splitting heads open, and there's def definitely other injuries occurring out there. So that came down. Um, the st some of the unsafe structures came down, and one of the things we heard from children is they wanted more area to be able to play and run and have grassy areas for basketball or for soccer games, football games. And so we have a little bit more of a grassy area now, but because the um, project happened so late into the season last summer, we haven't had um, a chance for the grass to really grow. And so right now the kids are just playing on dirt or asphalt and that's causing a lot of, um, kids are falling a lot and getting hurt from that as well. There's not, they don't have a lot of grassy area right now to play on. Thank you. Uh, I asked that question because obviously there's a lot of talk right now concerned about school safety and we oftentimes think about certain things, but this, um, as a hypothetical, this is, is actually happening. And um, we did have the cost to closely finish this project in next year's budget, and as Aaron said, we took that out to, to bring on the, I think, a very legitimate um, alternative, which is the, to advance the study for overall building uh, assessment. But this really is a, a, an immediate, issue that I think what Aaron and Jason and others are trying to do is be sure they have your blessing to, to go out to the larger community and ask for uh, some kind of a fund drive, but wouldn't want, would, would, would want to do that without knowing that you support that. And it, 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 I also want to just um, repeat what Aaron said. That playground is used by the larger community. It's used by people that summer here and rent homes in the summer. It's used by people visiting and traveling through. It is not just for the school day. And it may be something that down the road in terms of this discussion that you're gonna have about one town concept, be talking to town about maybe they could help with some of this as well. Elizabeth? Um, you bring up an interesting point. Uh, in my conversations with other uh, board members and other towns, um, it was brought to my attention that in Yarmouth in particular, um, a former superintendent, Ken Murphy, was very careful in, in talking about that the, the school buildings and the teachers and the students were the school budget's responsibility, 
but the grounds and the playgrounds were used by the entire town. Like you said, summer people, after school, before school, whatever. And so those are town maintained structures and properties. And so it's, an, it's just an interesting conversation to have that the school is, is look, you know, has in the past borne this cost. Now we're looking at trying to do some fundraising, but um, the fact that these are used by everybody and not just the schools, um, who, who needs to be you know, bearing the cost and the responsibility for making sure they're updated and evaluated and, uh, inspected. and inspected, that's where I'm going, yeah. So I do hope we have that conversation. Um, my, and I have a question, which is, so would this fundraising effort get us to full completion, or would it just take care of nature land? I think it depends on how, how well the fundraising goes. Um, Reach for the it, stars. I would love to do the whole entire thing, but if, if for right now, if we can accomplish nature land, it would be great. Yeah. Um, but ideally, I think if we can do the whole project, it would be much more successful. I'm afraid that if we only complete part of it, I don't know if that the rest of it will ever get That's done. the worry. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you. I was in a lot of those meetings with the mm -hmm. playground um, and a lot of the formation of it all. And uh, I apologize that it's not in the budget. And I commend you for reaching out and being creative and thinking of other ways to make it happen because it is important. And there are hard decisions that we are making as administrators and board. And it's not that we don't believe in it. So I just. I just want to say thank you to to stick in with your guns, Aaron, and, 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 and keep plugging away and keep trying to find a solution. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I also want to apologize and say I'm, I'm really sorry that this, you know, it did not make the cut. It's it's not what we wanted. Um, and you absolutely have our, our permission in about a second after we vote <laughs> to fundraise. And please let us know whatever we can do to help. Because I'm on board. Thank you, John. Just briefly, get th thanks for your um, dedication and creativity to this. And I just wanted to add on to what Elizabeth was saying about town facilities. I think that's actually uh, in casual conversation with um, both Jimmy Garvin and Councillor Strauss, separate conversations. Um, how we treat facilities might be one of those creative ways that we can look at. Um, that will be advantageous because we are a town and school district. We may be able to do some things with that going forward that could be um, advantageous to both. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's just the beginning of that, that conversation. So let's mark, sock that away for a, a, a bigger conversation for later. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. I feel like it's been years that I've heard you talking about the playground, and I, I just, I appreciate your your passion and that you haven't given up on this project. And I'm, I'm sorry that it's taken so long, um, and I too am sorry that it's not in the budget this year. But hopefully, we'll we'll see it happen soon. <laughs> Before Harper gets there. <laughs> or more for our lawyer. Are there any? <laughs> Are there any ramifications of someone from outside the town gets hurt? Do they sue the town, do they sue the school, do they sue both, and we're one and the same? Uh, well, if someone, if, if someone were, I've actually experienced this, where um, a summer um, member, if someone went into home and, and they went over to the school playground and their child was on a piece of equipment that was not properly installed, child a book a, a, a limb and they sued the district and the district was their um, insurance had had to be negotiated and settle it so they go to the school district they don't um, that it's, it's on school grounds and we, um, but I mean if it was the case that the town were to say we are responsible for um, all school grounds that would include all that would include the playground then I think that maybe the town would be responsible for the inspections and for the annual review and looking at all the things that you that there's a, a whole list of things you go through to be sure that you're ready to, to go to the next school year if they if, if they own that then they probably would own the responsibility if something did fail that I would assume that their insurance would then be responsible for getting involved in some kind of a settlement. Okay. So right now, right now it's us. And, it's, and this is on Perry's list. 
of whether it's up to code or not, and make sure the inspection shows up. Oh, it's our responsibility. I mean, there are, there are people that come through and, and, uh, and, and they, they have come through and they want to see if there's so many inches of cushion when a child comes off the slide and uh, looking at the, uh, any number of things. But yes, that, that, that's supposed to happen now. You're saying, and I think you're probably right, that that's not been something that's happened every year, but it should, and I'm assuming it will happen. I, I, I mean, Catherine's here, you're, we're talking now about, not this minute, but recently about our insurance company wanting to come in and look carefully with us about injuries and both for employees and for guests, and this will be on that list. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All those in favor? John? John. <laughs> <laughs> it's been that kind of day. <laughs> okay, item 6B, may I have a motion please? I move we approve the high school teacher Bill Brewington's proposal for the installation of a greenhouse on school grounds. Second. Second. Elizabeth? Yeah. Any discussion? Is this, um, is this an approval to move forward with fundraising or with the actual plan itself? Well, uh, Mr. Regan is here. He, maybe he can help. I mean, I think that you asked him to come back with a bit more information and mm -hmm. think about is this going to be a coordinated effort with other departments or other schools or perhaps this more to talk about. <coughs> Good evening. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting month um, since the proposal for the greenhouse was presented to the school board in April. Um, one thing that happened, I was able to attend the, the annual conference sponsored by the Maine School Garden Network oh, neat. that pulled together educators from across the state of Maine. Um, it was eye-opening, inspiring, and somewhat overwhelming to hear of so many ways that schools from every part of the state have been incorporating gardening into their districts. The keynote speaker is a gentleman from Scarborough who sparked international attention in 2008 with a video online that uh, prompted Michelle Obama to revive the gardening tradition on the White House lawn. It's a really interesting video. If you have a chance to watch that, it's still on YouTube. Um, that garden is a great example of the ripple effects that gardens create when they support educational goals, enhance community building, and contribute to jo social, social justice efforts. That talk and all the rest of the workshop sessions, garden reports, panel discussions, and presentations reinforce the theme of the power of gardens and gardeners. Um, I was also privileged to attend a workshop session during the conference led by a former student of mine, um, Sasha Lennon, who is serving in her second year with Food Corps here in Maine. Another highlight of the day was touring and learning about the greenhouses at the Maine Academy of Natural Sciences meeting greenhouse directors from other schools and hearing of how greenhouses fit into the educational programs of several schools in our state. The proposal that I presented last month to explore the possibility of building a greenhouse at the high school has generated many responses, emails, and conversations. The list of people I've contacted and the ones that have reached out to me include faculty and staff at the high school, um, the director of facilities and maintenance, here at the district, a teacher at Pond Cove, parents of students, former students of mine, current students, a couple of um, have volunteered to help with the greenhouse designing piece, and some have indicated interest in starting the Botany Club. Um, directors of greenhouses at nearby educational institutions, teachers and staff at other schools in Cumberland County, members of the Cape Farm Alliance, neighbors and friends, and so on. And every conversation has been laced with positive comments, encouragement, and often ends with recommendations of more people I should talk to. Um, <laughs> hence, I started a binder. <laughs> um, yeah, and I just close with this. An email I received from a community member I've never met included the lines, I congratulate you on the proposal to add a greenhouse to the school's campus. What a great idea, long overdue. And she ended with, onward with your plans. Um, I'm optimistic that will be the case, and thank you again for your time in considering this proposal. Um, I looked over the proposal I read last month and that you've had a month to look at, and I don't feel a need to change anything in there. I think um, the, 
goals of having a greenhouse and what that could add to our curriculum and add to the educational programs in our, all of our schools um, still stands. I'd like to see it move forward with looking at where that might happen. Perry and I talked um, at length about possibilities on the campus where that might work and what he's seen in other schools that he's worked at. Um, that was one of the more encouraging conversations I had actually was to have him reminisce on what greenhouses were like where he's worked before. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there's any other questions from the proposal that you saw from last month that I could answer now. So I, I think, Bill, um, I think just going by what Hope was asking, I'd like to just be clear on what we are approving tonight. It, it sounds like we're approving you to pursue it. Is pursue that... the exploration of can we do this? Right. Um, could we start to raise funds to that mm -hmm. end? Yeah. Yes. Oh, so if we approve it, it doesn't mean it'll be tomorrow, right? It's <laughs> not going to happen tomorrow. Unfortunately, then, so. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would love to see it happen sooner rather than later, but a couple of years, I don't know how long it's going to take. I have a question. So, as you know, it may be relatively easy to build when we find the funds. It's maintaining, as you showed for the playground, mm -hmm. the maintaining part is the most difficult part. Yes. So what, what will you give that a thought or not? And the other question is, will it be utilized in the summer? Are you going to be available in the summer to maintain it or are you going to have? Close by house, cabin. I mean, things like this. <laughs> things like this take a life of their own. They can go in lots and lots of different directions. Um, having it at the high school to use as a science lab is my initial intent. And I think, if you talk to biology teachers at most schools, they can think of lots of ways you could use a greenhouse and biology courses. Um, but as you have something like that facility, I think it would draw other people to want to come over with students. So they're doing other projects, um, raising seedlings for gardens. There could be use for the summer. I don't see much of that happening. Greenhouses are pretty hard to maintain year-round, um, and without staff here in the summer, it'd be hard. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? I forget. Oh, one question: Who is the uh, keynote speaker? That was the the video you referred to in the keynote speech. Who you didn't I, mention the name of the? Yeah, I could give you his oh, name. Oh, do you I know it? Or if, if, I have it in my notes, but I'll get it from you later then. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say again that I, I'm, I'm thrilled with, with this pursuit. I really am. Um, I've always admired the greenhouse at Paz and uh, envious of what the students there have. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled with the prospect of offering that to all, all grades. So thank you. thank you. May I have a vote? All those in favor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm Go sorry. sorry. I'm still not sure I'm clear on just the wordings because it says approve the proposal for installation. So does that mean we're may, installing may, it, may, or may, are we approving may, the installation? I just want may to I answer that? that? Yes, please. So I think what you're doing um, is you're giving concept support to this idea. Okay. It's a concept. And, and there, you, have, you don't have any details to, so what, what Bill has now is the encouragement to go forward and come back with more specifics about what that would look like, what size, how, how the water would work. Um, and it, I think it would probably involve Perry coming back saying, oh, we, we can do this, here's where, the location. It's just right now, it's a concept. So what you're doing is saying that the concept is appealing to you, if it is, sure. and then he knows that he's not just um, wasting his time Perhaps. spinning wheels. Oh, sorry. Uh, sir? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, uh, Hope does have a point, but then there's also a reference to the DFR, and almost every letter in here is fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. So, I think this explains it a lot to me. So. Heather? I'm, I think what Hope might be saying is, I think she understands that it's concept, but does mm -hmm. this language match? Mm -hmm. Do we need to tweak this approval? so that it sounds more like it's a concept support and not an actual mm -hmm. installation. It's, and I, I know we've done that before. We've yeah. adjusted the wording to We can strike the word proposal and put down and, and replace it with the word concept. Yeah. Can we have mm -hmm. a motion to amend the? I move, how do I do this? I move we amend. <laughs> I'm like, I'll do it, how? Um, <laughs> you were the original, so. so I was the original? So, yeah. so I propose amendment. we yeah. make an amendment yeah. to item 6B. Item 6B and change the word proposal to concept. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, brief discussion so it, to go around. Mohammed's earlier point about the fundraising piece. 
the fund, that fundraising policy is exactly what makes sure that we're coordinated with Perry and all the maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. So when it comes back, if it's in compliance with that, with our policy, then we will have all of that handled and integrated before it gets approved for ha accepting any funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any the amended proposal on the table. It's on the table, and... Do you need a second? We already got a second, I believe. We got one from, didn't we? The second came from, I, from Hope, and now yeah. you, want, you want to vote now to amend the motion. Oh, thank you. So, um, all those in favor of amending the motion? Mm -hmm. Then do we have to vote now mm -hmm. on it? Okay. On the, on, now you <laughs> now vote, on vote on the amended, amended motion. motion. All right. Um, all those in favor of uh, approving the amended motion? Thank you. Go forward, I young man. I love these Roberts rules yeah. kind of nice. They're oh. so fun. <laughs> so bad. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Moving on to item 6C. May I have a motion? I move we accept the following CEF awarded grant with an approximate value in excess of $15,000, a multi-model learning for student, uh, okay, multi-model learning for students receiving speech and language services. A second. Any discussion? I, Looks like John. It, may, may, may I speak to this? Sure. Well, I'm sorry if John wants to speak first. Go ahead. Is it okay. multimodal or multimodal? Do we have a typo? Is what I'm I was going to say that's why I had a little trouble because I, I thought it was multimodal. That's what I think it is. But oh dear, you have to. Okay. Um, <laughs> do we have to amend this? <laughs> let's just mumble. Okay. As an attempt. Oh God. <laughs> Everybody heard modal. Um, so, um, as some of you will remember, a couple of years ago, the school board, in working with CEF, came up with some new uh, procedures for approval of grants. And the board felt that the smaller grants could and should just be left in, in uh, the hands of um, the administration and the teachers and CEF <laughs> understanding that those grants have to start by having the support of the building level administrator and that they would be shared with the superintendent and if something just seemed, no, this isn't a good idea, they would be taken off the list. Which, by the way, that happened this time. I mean, I met with the leadership of CEF early on and said, you know what, I'm not sure, this, I'm, I'm not comfortable with this, and they said, we aren't either. So a couple of them didn't. Uh, didn't uh, go any further than that. So it really, the, the new procedures are working quite well. Perfect. And so um, the, the, they, as you know, had a whole bunch of applications this, the, the, this spring and came up with a, a list that they could support for somewhere around $30,000, I believe. One of those um, is, is um, it, it over the required point to where you get involved and have to actually take a formal vote to approve or not. And um, the proposal that is in the neighborhood of $15,000 was submitted with the blessing uh, of all three principals, apparently. And um, it was presented um, as a, an idea that would support um, enhancing multimodal, M-O-D-A-L, uh, <laughs> learning through technology. And apparently it has a, a, a lot of this is um, a, dealing with coming up with projectors and mounts, but primarily 12 iPads and 12 iPad cases and some whiteboards. And the teachers feel that with this, they can enhance the learning for students that are receiving speech and language support. Um, and, and that there's a long explanation as to what they would do with that and why it advantages the children. It was compelling to the committee. Um, I went over this today with Noel to see if this was, was any kind of a problem for him and technology department. It's not. And he also said that he has talked about this with Perry in terms of any installation of whiteboards. That also wasn't a problem for them. So they felt that they're on board with this. And actually, I think that Noel was saying he thinks it's a, it's a pretty neat idea. So um, it's got the support of, again, the three principals, CEF, uh, our technology director, and director of buildings and grounds. So I think you're all set. Kimberly? Are we at a discussion point, or do we, can I ask yeah, a question? Yeah, we are at a discussion point. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it better be a back. really easy question. <laughs> Where we yeah. Right. Um, Almost eight, I was just thinking about the, you know, sort of the rapid turnover um, of technology. Is there any accounting for that in this plan, or is is this just funding the initial um, technology, and then we, you know, I, iPads? Yeah. Are, See, and then I, we would I, I think that we use over. iPads on average around five years. I mm -hmm. think. And so this would, these should be good for some number of years. This, the, the, this um, detailed proposal talks about the fact that um, there just simply isn't enough money in the special education budget to afford this. And primarily we would provide uh, iPads to, to students, and, and, but again, only at certain grade levels. Yep. And uh, so I think that for five years, in theory, this should, should take care of them. Of course, five years out, that's right. when that's what I'm they'll be knocking about. on the so door. Then that again. would fall right. to the. But I would think at that point we should, if it's successful, it should be part of our budget. Yep. This should really be seen as a, a seed, a seed grant. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good uh, I, I'd also add that gen generally display technology lasts longer than the actual devices, so the projectors often have a lifetime that's longer than a than an iPad or a, a, a processing device. So uh, projectors like this is probably quite, you know, much more than five years old. They, last, they, they still function, they still serve as function, so they actually is quite, and like I said, Steve funds things to get us started just so we can demonstrate its effectiveness, and I'm very optimistic and encouraged by this. It looks, it looks like a great project. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad this is, okay, so let's, uh, um, all those in favor? I'm excited that there is such an uh, increase in applications. Yeah, this year. I know it's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Next item, 6D. May I have a motion? I move we approve the following draft job description: home slash school service coordinator for the middle school. Do you have a second? I second. <coughs> what is this? So this would be um, <laughs> for Troy. That was me, Troy. What is this? So we had previously talked about adding a social worker to the middle school budget, and then I really got thinking about in every different school there's a different role that each of those people play. Um, in my past life, in my other places, a social worker was really a connector of services. Um, how I understand social workers here to work, um, or at least one in my building, and I think it's different from building to building in the need that the kids have, but here it's really focused with um, direct support for IEP services, largely, and that becomes really overwhelming. And I think right now our social worker is, has a full plate. I think we're in the process of reevaluating how we're identifying kids to get that level of service. You know, the, a therapeutic level of counseling service is pretty deep for for some of that. So, so when I really got thinking about the needs of our school now that I've been here for a year, what do we what do we really need? And how are we going to help those kids that we all know or worry about our own kids falling through the gaps, so to speak? Um, and what I've learned and what I've come to find out is we really have social work needs. And we have counseling needs through our school counselors. And those roles kind of support each other. But really, their school counselors in the middle school level are really teaching all 500 kids the, the guiding principles around career preparation. And that doesn't mean you want to be a doctor. That means what are your skill sets? What are, you, what are you good at? What do you like to do? And then trying to teach them to think about that as they choose their career paths. So that's a pretty full-time plate right there on top of also conflict resolution, you know, the things that go on with, with that a little bit with, with basically the whole population. Um, what I've come to realize that, that there's a gap with is some of that home to school communication and support for parents, for students, um, talking about the mental health and the anxiety that is play I've noticed is really high here um, and a lot of pressure to, to achieve and keep up with your peers. And I'm not sure that that fits in the social worker realm. And I'm not sure that it fits under the school counselor realm either of what we have. And I think that's why we're seeing this problem or this concern really be hard to address as I've, as I've come to watch. Um, I've seen some success. And there's a few things that I, I would find um, that I've identified would be really helpful for us. And one is the whole, I, I don't want to say truancy because truancy really is a small part of attendance. We have a lot of kids that miss a lot of school that are not truant. 
that they have excused absences, but they, they're large in number. And right now, that's hard, to tr that's hard for somebody to really go out and make that their mission to, to really dig into and find out what's going on and how can we be more supportive, because everybody is already doing other things. So I'm not sure that that's really just the scope of a social worker as we know it in our school. And one fear is if we have another social worker, there's going to be many more referrals coming in, and that time is going to be eaten up by a small amount of kids again. And not that they don't need that, but I think we, I'm really interested in the whole school body and how do we support that. The other part is this initiative, and there's always many initiatives, so that's why it's not in the job description that it's that, that I didn't want to put it in there, but one is for restorative practices or restorative justice. I haven't really seen a lot of, a lot of need for um, handing out consequences in my role as a principal at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Because a lot of things are not rising to the level of a consequence, but there's still a lot of things that need to be addressed. Blocking people at the slide, you know, all of those kind of things that have impacts on people that seem small in the moment, but over time build up to this, this bigger deal. And so those are the types of things that restorative justice or restorative practices, really about empowering victims, is about. Somebody has to take that role on if we want to start to roll that out. And everybody's plates are pretty full. The other part that I have found that I really am intrigued by is the idea of the high school's freshman academy. I have so many parents wanting to know more about freshman academy and you know, how can, that, can my kid be in that and how do I do that? And I, and I just see it as that's something we're missing. And if, if we have kids needing that when they leave, why can't we solve that issue before they get to the high school? And how can I be more proactive in that? Because those needs don't just all of a sudden become real as freshmen. So how do we address that? So that's why I sat down and decided to really think about what is it that we really are, are going for here? Um, and I think my, what I heard the board say loud and clear was we have a lot of needs. There's a lot of stuff that kids need more support with. Um, and a social worker, I think, sounds like the right job description, but when I really got looking at it, I found it to be more limiting than what I think the scope or need is that we need it. So that's kind of the rationale as to why I've kind of went this way and put this together, because I think it's a better description of what would benefit the larger student body. Helpful? Very helpful, Troy. Thank you so much for uh, your observations, and uh, I commend you for making this, this shift in, in the role of the, it will be the new social worker, is that right? It, it would be, and, I, you know, and, it, and it's in the qualifications. As Howard always says, we want to cast a broad net. Yeah. So to just limit it to a certain one skill set seemed to me narrowing the field of applicants instead of widening it. You know, so to me, and, it, and I'm open for suggestions, but it could be a social worker, it could be an LCSW, it could be somebody with a psychology degree, it could be, I just want the best person that can come in and, and really help facilitate those discussions and, and be supportive for our kids and families. So that's kind of the rationale behind it, and it very well could be a social worker but it would not fall under the social worker job description if, if this were to succeed. I guess I was just wondering, would this person be coming under the grant? Oh, okay, so in, it's budget neutral, um, and, I, and with working with Jessica and Catherine, um, more with Jessica, it's essentially a pers one position who's <coughs> going to go away from the grant and be absorbed into the regular budget. She's gonna maintain in the grant, and this one would just go into the regular budget. So it's still the same net impact of being budget neutral. Um, I just want to say thank you for uh, thinking of the whole child. Uh, and in light of what Mr. Shedd was saying earlier about anxiety in the article that he referred us to, I agree with you, it doesn't suddenly start in ninth grade. So if we can support these kids in middle school, give them some skills, um, maybe when they do get to high school, it, it's not quite as severe. They have some more coping mechanisms that Freshman Academy or other the social workers up there can help build on, but they have a baseline to yeah. work from, or a stronger baseline. I'm sure they already have a baseline. I know there's work being done, but I, so I appreciate that, of yeah. really yeah. attacking it and seeing it as an important and vital piece of the middle school that is not just a high school issue. And I think the trick is to not lower expectations to lower anxiety. It's teach right. people skills to deal with that right. while maintaining high expectations. Yes. So I think that's the trick of the game a little bit to, to provide those resources. So. Um, so my understanding is that there's currently 
a social worker that has is almost occupied full time with with their duties, and that there's very little room in their schedule, if any, for just the regular kids who need that that social worker right. services. So my concern is that we're that there is we don't even know what the need is there because we've never had the availability. You know, there may be kids who have need the, the needed those services, but they just can't get them because the current social worker is occupied. So my concern is that we're taking the role and maybe diversifying it. I I, I don't. I don't want to diversify it so much and, and try to do too many things when we may really have just needed that so social worker in a traditional sense mm -hmm. for those kids who can't get to one right now. Right. So our school counselors do provide counseling mm -hmm. also for people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really identifying what is the need for a clinical level social work. Mm -hmm. So intensive clinical level social work in the middle of a school day, presumably. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's pretty, that's, that should be a high level of need. Um, so currently, and I think that we, I, I, I agree, I don't think there's a lot of room to expand that currently with what we have, but I think that we need to really seriously look at how are we identifying who's currently getting those services? Mm -hmm. You know, are we over-servicing? And are we double-servicing? In some cases, speech and language can very well pick up some of what social work also does. Um, we have a lot of students with a lot, all receiving services. And I, I think, I'm not into taking services from anyone, but are we being efficient mm -hmm. is really kind of more of what, I, what I'm feeling like. Um, school counselors also, they, they are providing counseling. Um, so to me, it's really more about the holistic approach. And this position would also be one that would re make referrals to outside counselors for families and help them to make those connections. Uh, that would be a big part. And then the last part that I kind of forgot to mention, but an unintended consequence right now too is, Teachers have a lot on their plate, so they're trying to do all of this. And what happens a lot is people, I think, are being referred to the RTI process. So we have two RTI, inter, you know, response to intervention teachers, and what I see is they are working very hard to provide a service that I think should really not be there. It's really executive functioning, um, you know, help with organization and planning and, and all of that, and it, and it falls to their level, and then it really has been impeding their ability to provide direct, focused, intense instruction to fill academic gaps. So I, th I think a lot of this is shaking down and it's impacting other people. Mm -hmm. Whereas if that could be stopped, it would also, I believe, increase the efficiency of our RTI people. Just to follow, can you clarify again how it affects the grant? The grant was. Um, so, I'm not a grant expert, and I'm counting on Jessica for this from <laughs> special ed. Um, but essentially, there was a plan to move a position off from the grant. She said she'll just keep it on the grant, and this position will go into the the, the regular budget. Am I right, Catherine? Tell me I am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, so so it's budget neutral. It doesn't instead of moving a person currently under the grant off, it's just going to leave that person on and this one will go okay. to the regular budget. Okay. John? So I, was just gonna, I actually think this is a really um, smart and creative approach because part of what I see that it's able to do is that the, the communication between home and school is actually really challenging and uh, there's a piece of that that teachers are responsible for and that social workers are responsible for and, and all the professionals are sort of responsible for and sort of being able to put that in a way that is coordinated and more effective I think is really smart because you're then you're actually leveraging a really key asset that's not being as well leveraged as it could be right now which is those parents and when you get school and parents and home working uh, together that's really powerful and I've had personal examples where that's been really great and uh, to see more of that would be great. And it sounds like if this is well implemented, it will ease on the margins some of the impacted professionals to some degree. For sure. Um, so uh, it, it seems like a very appealing approach to me and a very creative approach. I appreciate that. Ms. Do you foresee this person also kind of being um, a facilitator of communication out to teachers so that um, everybody is sort of aware of what's going on with a particular student and, um, you know, whether it's a 504 situation or, you know, some other thing where, you know, people just really all need to be on the same page with what's going on with a student? Because yes. 
you know, sometimes that can be lacking. Yep, I definitely do. And I think it's almost a pseudo case management role, mm. although it would not be fair to say they would take on 50 kids and be effective. Um, but I think it's about making connections for kids. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, it might be that I'm an, a teacher, but I, this person knows through good relationships that I have a connection with a kid. And maybe my view would be then kind of work with that person to become that kid's kind of um, informal case manager and, and advocate really for, for that. So I think that's one way. I think the 504 th is actually a great idea. I had kind of hadn't thought of adding that to that. Um, but yes, I think, I think that's powerful. Any way we can increase communication is huge. And, it has to, and it's hard because right now there's four or five different keepers of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Some it's a social worker, some it's a guidance counselor, some it's me, some it's this. And it's really hard to kind of put all those into one place. And if I'm a parent, I don't really know where that place is. And that's part of, I think that's what I've been able to see as a big need that we can kind of fix. And sometimes when you add another job, when you add another position that is already a current job description, that job becomes that. And it's somewhat limiting. When you create a new one, you get that chance to make it new and you make it be actually what it is that we feel like we need. Now, sir. Yeah, uh, for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a, I don't want to say a problem, but I think the, the title could be fixed because home implies that the, not, I, don't, I know you don't want to call a social worker, the person is able to provide support at home as well. If the person was to be hired, is this the title they're going to have on their badge? Because if you get rid of the word home, you say school service co coordinator, I mean, that could be many things. Uh, yeah, I wasn't in love with the title either because I was thinking of homeschool. Like the home <laughs> so, so I kind of struggled with that as well. But I really wanted to get the point across that it's a connection. I think that everything's a triangle of home, you know, home or family or parents, student, school. And how do we, how do we make that triangle work? So it could be called family services, family school coordinator. I just wanted to get the picture across that it's really meant to be a support for home, for that parent to make that connection outside yeah. of the school. I, so I would say the whole child, so maybe we can come up with some word like that as well. The so whole child, starting from home to school. Are yes. we able to approve the concept without the actual job title, Howard? Okay. Right, but I think that what, yes. Um, I, I think that <laughs> at some point though, we, 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 need, we, a we, we need to nail it down. Yeah. But I think Troy wants to get started by having, holding interviews and giving people who are applying for the job some general sense of the responsibilities and for them to be able to say, well, this is a job that appeals to me or it doesn't. So, but this is a, 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 a variation of what we've been doing, so it, 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 as long as he would know that the general ideas here that are being identified are, are um, supported by you, then I think he feels he's, he can present this as, as a draft to uh, future, to potential candidates. Kimberly? I, uh, Troy, thank you, I appreciate your thoughtfulness on this, and I would just, I think, I've had a child in the middle school for four years and I think I'm starting to figure out like who you reach out to and <laughs> so I, I would say there's a very real need at the middle at the elementary school it's much clearer and having a single teacher that aids the process but the middle school's uh, more complex in uh, identifying your contact points so Perfect. I think it's great. so I'll have you come speak to the fourth graders coming into fifth grade I will I'll be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if I could just add um, a little bit of a student perspective, I just really commend you for um, this job and creating this because um, I've gone here since kindergarten um, and middle school here, probably everywhere, um, is a really hard time and I think that if you implement these services, like you said, like that's when those, those situations don't become as intense when they transition into high school. And I think that um, I would love to talk to you about it more, but also um, Ms. Nato, uh, the social worker, Joyce Nato at the high school, um, does a lot of these things really successfully. Um, I've had personal experience with that, so possibly reaching out to her um, and having her guidance on that would be helpful. Perfect, come on down. <laughs> I think that's a great suggestion, you yeah. know, when you do have your interview committee considering um, asking Joyce if she's available. Um, 
I, I, you know, Nasser, you just mentioned it briefly, but I, in terms of a name, I know we're not going to de deliberate tonight, but I kind of like the idea of holistic service coordinator, just throwing it out there. And then, um, Elizabeth, your point, I think, is a really important point to make, that the, the communication, as you're saying, um, so that everybody, even if they're not directly involved with the student, is aware. Everybody's right. on the same page. And, and furthermore, between the grades, a lot is lost over the summer. And it's amazing how many students arrive in the fall and teachers are totally unaware of Start the situation. Over. Yeah. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, two jobs. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor? So this will come back, hopefully, for a second reading, so to speak, at, in June. We'll give that. Okay. Yeah. Great. Item 6C, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the letter of intent from the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. May I have a second? A second. Uh, any discussion, please? So, my understanding was we uh, have met. I would like to, I'll just share that uh, Heather and um, Howard and um, Mr. Phillips and Fran Vita, I was gonna, I was gonna say Vita Taylor and make it, <laughs> um, met to have a discussion around um, codifying some um, agreement between the board and the association that we all uh, prioritize and recognize the importance of planning time. And the included letter is um, a draft that, that, is, I, that I feel is still a work in progress, <laughs> frankly. Um, so I leave it up to the to the board. Um, I think there's still a little. I think there's still work to do, though. So. Anybody else? Um, I'll just add. So I. You know, looking at it for the first time, I think it, I only have my contacts from the policy committee meeting, and I think it represented what we talked about, which was we wanted to make a, um, and I'm taking sort of the historical knowledge secondhand, that the intent is to make a commitment to ensuring that we, we continue to respect the concept of planning time. Um, and I think that it covers that well. Um, but then it goes on to include certain details that I, 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 I don't know if even at this moment we're able to say we're not going to be running afoul of the details in the letter. So I think at, at this point this evening, I don't think we can say the letter is 100% accurate. So we have to take, take another stab at the draft before we conclude it. John? So I was just going to add for, um, I think the board is very supportive of planning time as an important piece of the education and uh, entered into this sort of a letter of intent uh, to sort of show that commitment, I think is certainly appropriate. Um, and I applaud uh, anyone who takes the first draft of stuff. That's always actually the, the hardest pass, and we really appreciate it. When I read through it, I felt like um, we could actually make a stronger and clearer commitment the front of the letter to sort of say this is what our principles are this is really what we want to guarantee um, and then that will lead to the necessary details that will support that I feel there's a little bit of a gap right now in this draft in terms of the clarity up front and then what details would be implied from that and so great start we certainly believe in it and look forward to sort of getting to where I, I don't think there's any uh, disagreement in principle I just think we sort of just it's that's where we're at with the draft right now so um, keep going <laughs> we are very supportive. I'd like to add that I think I bear, we bear some of the responsibility. We thought that we might be able to get the, the uh, draft uh, to a different place before the business meeting. And so I know that in our meeting, we kind of put the pressure on a little bit. But I think we want to get it right. Um, thank you, everybody, for your input. I, I confessed, uh, confessed that I, I wasn't prepared to, to vote just just by timing. I wasn't. I had not carefully reviewed the draft, so I'd feel more comfortable um, just waiting, tabling, tabling it. Um, not, but not for any indication that it's it's not something we all intend to approve. Um, just I, I need a little more time because I haven't given it proper time for, before tonight. Um, so may I have a motion to table this for the next meeting? Second that. So. So moved. <laughs> so moved. Thank you. Do we vote? Sorry. All those in favor? This is where I get really bad. Um, 
Thank you. I don't know Robert very well, Robert. <laughs> okay, um, item 6F, please. May I have a motion? Do we have to say I move to approve? Like, how do we do this one? Because I was ready to do it. But how about we just uh, for do the I sake just of time. read it? No, no. Why don't you just say we approve F as, as written? Yeah. Okay, I move we approve F as written and as laid out in our tonight's agenda materials. I second. Thank you. Any discussion? I, I have, um, if, if this if passes tonight, I have two copies of this that need to be signed by all of you. Um, God bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, just for the purpose of public hearing, it, could we just have a, a brief overview as to the function of this motion? That, I believe that this then yeah. goes to the town uh, <coughs> office and then they use that to um, build their presentation for um, um, the warrant subject to the outcome of the, the vote on the 14th. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so this is the official functionary motion to send this to right. forward. Yeah. In the form <laughs> that it's required. Yeah, maybe something to add. Okay. Okay. And I just wanna, I'd like to add to that also that um, tonight the school board signs it. This vote also gives the, superintendent authority so if the amount changes Monday night when this council votes on it he can sign off saying yes this is the actual amount that is supposed to go to the voters without having to get all the rest of you together to sign the document so it's kind of a two-fold situation mm -hmm. so. thank you all those in favor um, and let's make sure we do sign that Okay, so we have a pencil. Here, I'm borrowing Please. Heather's pen. We have to return it. So, okay. next motion, um, I mean, next item, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve. G is written. G is written in our agenda packet. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Um, I'm sure who was a second? Uh, John. Any discussion? Just just briefly, this is the official motion that allows us to do what Catherine had referred to earlier, which is move uh, monies within state categories yeah, at the end of the fiscal year. Yeah. This is the official vote that allows that to happen. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. How do we need two copies? There's two copies. Uh, I, w w I think that um, if you don't mind signing both of them, it would be appreciated. And um, new to uh, the monthly we business did. agenda, may I have a motion for item 6H? Thank you. I move we approve monthly financials. Can we have a second? Thank you. Any discussion? I appreciate having this at the um, business meeting instead of the, um, right. finan you know, the finance committee workshops. I think it, I, it I allows agree. us to have a little bit more clarity. So thank you, Catherine. All those in favor? Okay. Who, who's the second? Uh, the last motion is second. I, I've had it down for the motion. I read it. I who, who's the second? You seconded. Oh. Who made the motion? No, I made the motion. I, I'll volunteer to say Okay. <laughs> I have John, but I didn't want to be. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm the last one, but anyway. Okay. So, um, Next, committee reports. Um, negotiations committee, um, we can report that we are um, dissolving the committee. <laughs> <We're>, the, the <laughs> nego <laughs> negotiations have concluded with all three bargaining units um, that we were working with this winter and spring. Um, there have been, we feel like that was a successful negotiations where um, we came to win-win with um, all the bargaining units. Uh, we just finished with um, EdTech's twos and threes. We had previously um, finished negotiations with the single unit, which is comprised of bus drivers, food service workers, maintenance, and custodians. And then um, we also um, successfully closed negotiations with um, EdTech one and the secretaries, our uh, administrative support. 
So um, that work has been completed and I would like to thank first of all, Catherine Messmer. We could not have done anything like this without you. Thank you to Superintendent Howard Coulter and I personally would like to extend my gratitude to um, new board member Hope Straw who mm -hmm. was incredibly valuable to this process. There will be no more meetings of the negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> so don't Thank you both for your time and hard work on this. I know it's a lot to ask. You're brand new, but it's, she was fantastic. It's, it's, you know, you're not brand new, but it's still a lot of work. No matter if you're newer or old. Old. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Any other committee reports? Uh, for building and grounds, we've discussed um, coming up with a building. Um, committee, I guess is what we would call it, comprised of a variety of um, school members, community members, town council, police, and so we hope to move forward with that. Great. Policy. Uh, policy committee met during the first week of, this is May, and uh, we are currently um, trying to rework the, um, the policy for hiring professional staff just so that not only does it um, comply with our um, contracts, but you know makes sense and is user friendly for all involved. And um, we hope to bring you a first read in June. We also have been looking at the homework policy, and um, we have been lucky to have um, all the principals there, but also um, a parent who has um, really brought a lot of um, positive thought and, and research and experience to the discussion and we very much appreciate having her there. Um, I think that what we can report is that a lot of uh, the homework policy looks like it's a fairly good policy. There might be a few tweaks here and there. What we're really going to be advocating for is more communication about the policy. So not just from building principals to teachers but from, you know, from schools to parents. So parents can understand, yes, we do have a homework policy. This is what it is. If you know, you know, it, and there, are, there are you know recommended, you know, timeframes and guidelines, and it's not really sort of gotchas for teachers, but more like if your student is struggling and having a really hard time, and, and it takes so long, this might be outside the the recommended time for homework, and maybe you need to reach out to the teacher, reach out and to the principals, and kind of just figure out what's going on. So we also hope to have that policy for a first read in June. And um, the last thing, although it isn't um, in policy committee and it falls into procedures, um, we have been looking at the um, vaccination policy procedures. Um, Mr. Coulter and myself met with Mrs. Taylor and Ms. Young, the nurse at the middle school, just in talking about making sure that we are in compliance with the law around um, people either having all their um, vaccinations and reporting that they have those vaccinations or um, reporting in a timely manner that they are um, not going to vaccinate their children in their you know, different state statutes around how they can do that and why they can do that. And so um, the reason I bring this up, although there's really, there's no change in policy, um, we're going to be making sure that students are in power school or, or however, I, you know, we, there's some discussion about where the exemption is going to live. And I think the board hopes that the exemptions can live in power school, but we'll talk about that later. Um, that students are not going to come to school until all of that paperwork is complete and that nurses aren't chasing families down for long periods of time. That, and this may feel like a little bit of a shift, so uh, the, the lion's share of this is going to, again, follow on the principles for communication, making sure that um, families are aware that you know, this information has to be communicated, whatever you know, signatures and boxes checked and that sort of thing before students are coming to school to be in compliance with the law. So I just wanted to say it out loud and on TV. And policy will um, convene for the last time for the school year on Monday, June 4th at 3 p.m. 
in Jordan Conference Room. I'm getting that in now, so when there's announcements, I'm done. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Uh, IT uh, committee will be meeting uh, May 16 at 2.15. Okay. So Great. it's coming up next week. Thank you. Um, uh, the town comp um, his uh, meeting, the town comprehensive committee met May third, I believe it was um, after, <laughs> and and we'll be meeting again uh, May seventeenth. We're trying to make up on snow days. All the snow days fell on our meeting scheduled for March and February. Um, so it, we are currently um, in the agriculture chapter and uh, just completed the first draft of the water chapter actually really fascinating um, and really important, again, as I keep saying, for everybody t to be involved and be informed. Thank you. Um, any school board agenda requests? Could I request um, that we uh, maybe add evaluations to an upcoming agenda? We, I know we were rolling out the uh, new evaluation my teacher evaluation for this year, and um, it sounded like it was uh, people were getting a little bogged down um, in getting it done, and just wondering mm -hmm. kind of where we are on that. Yep. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Kimberly. Announcement of upcoming I, meetings. I have another one else. Oh, sorry. So, so um, I'm not sure the exact format, but I, I do think we're going to think about putting something on the calendar or a uh, hold placeholder for. Uh, getting uh, that town council, school board, community approach, creative ways to, that we begin to talk about how can we really tackle this funding um, problem long term and what long term planning and, and fundraising and uh, funding and fundraising and uh, looks like for the school, just whatever. Uh, and, and then maybe just an agenda item to talk about what would that look like? Um, but well, I, some, I, I so, something to get that. It, you know, on the calendar to begin the discussion uh, for our part as a school You're so board. right. And in fact, we uh, just, Howard, Heather, and I talked today about using our next workshop date for that, pur that purpose specifically, Great. at least to begin it on the school board side, yeah. to start strategizing and then reaching out to town council. Great. So thank you. That would be May 22nd? Yep, May 22nd, upcoming meetings. Um, and then also just co town comp wise, May 17th, we're meeting. Um, June 6th is the, our second public forum, which will be here, and we're hoping that um, Ted Jordan's, uh, some of his students will be here, and some of the filming crew will also be here from the high school. So that's June 6th, and then June 7th is the next uh, regular town comp meeting. Any other meetings? No. Oh, I do want to say, um, just I guess, I have this thought through, but we ha there was a public hearing last night that was held by the town council. It was it was not our um, agenda, but it was really well attended on behalf of the school, which was awesome. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody who has who has written in support of the school budget. Um, our work isn't done. Uh, an important meeting is um, May 14th for the town council to vote on the budget, um, and then presuming that passes, hoping that passes. Um, We'll be um, looking to June 12th for the referendum. Keep keep at it, everybody. So I, I I was there last night, and I just want to say I'm appreciative of, of I I have my own view. I'm glad that people agree with me, but I'm happy to hear all the views. And and um, this, again, this is always a community and a dialogue. And you know, we're, we're I'm del delighted to see a diversity of views, and we welcome them all. Um, uh, I was del Last night, was in particular, there were some very uh, supportive things said about our school that I particularly appreciated. And just so you know, it was a, it was a really truly inspiring and, and um, great public hearing. It it was videotaped. I didn't realize until today that it was videotaped. Many students from the middle school and the high school spoke um, under their own volition, which was incredible. And really, their, some of their points were excellent. I encourage everybody to listen to the public hearing from last night. Oh. May I have a motion for number 10? I move we adjourn. I second. Awesome. All those in favor? Thank you.